I want to share one more dream with you. Now, last weekend, I shared with you three IES dreams, a dream of unity, where we talked about unity not being uniformity, and we were challenged in, the, in, in coming near to the unity in the near future as we move forward as a church. I reminded you about snowflakes, and I hope you've been thinking in a positive way about snowflakes, how snowflakes are, are all very different and on their own, they can be easily melted and easily destroyed. But when you put them all together, they can be extremely strong. The second dream was a dream of purpose. And we talked about the value of focus. And I got to play with a laser pointer. And we talked about the value of common culture. And the dream that we have as a church of making an impact in the English-speaking community of Jakarta right now and in the generations to come. Finally... We looked at the story of Esther, and I talked about having a dream of opportunity. In Esther chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, we discovered four key things. We discovered that God will accomplish his purpose. We discovered that we are given a chance to participate in what God is doing. We discovered that if we don't take, a, an oppor, don't take advantage of the opportunity, it will not be God's loss. It will be our loss. And then finally, we discovered that to move like this, requires prayer and fasting. And I hope that all of you set some time aside in these last seven days. We said as a church, we would set aside two weeks of prayer and fasting. And I'm, I'm sure that those of you who didn't do a, a certain day when you would pray specifically for this project in the last seven days, are, I'm sure you're planning to do it in the next seven days, right? All right, I have an idea. Everybody get out your phone. Come on, get out your phone. Don't tell me you don't have a phone. That's impossible. Get out your phone. Get out your calendar. Look at the next seven days. Point your finger to one of those days. And then write in there, pray for the project. Pray for Vision 2020. Pray for IES New Home. And then hopefully you have some kind of program that calls things up off your calendar and so you'll be reminded. Now remember what I said, it's not about how long, it's not about how seriously you can pray, you can pray and fast. Uh, fasting without praying it probably doesn't do any good. Some people call that dieting, it doesn't really work. Um, but, but just that we're all together in this and we're praying for this and I hope you've set that all of those. For those of you who got distracted by some emails on your way in when you're checking your calendar, please uh, kind of put those things aside and uh, I want all of us to do that. And then finally, I asked you to begin to think about how your participation will be towards this project and we'll have an opportunity to express some things about that a little bit later. Tonight, we're going to talk about the fourth dream that we have for IES. And it's a dream of community. Now, some of you might say, well, Pastor Dave, you already talked about having a dream of unity. What's the difference between a dream of unity and a dream of community? Well, other than the fact that they rhyme and that one of them contains the other one uh, as a word, as a part of it, there is very, very little that's the same. In fact, there are two important concepts that we want to look at. So as we prepare to do that, let me invite all of you to stand to your feet because you know I'm not going to preach until we finish reading the Word of God and praying and asking Him to speak to our hearts. Let's read it together out loud. Familiar passage of Scripture. Uh, this is Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 41 and then reading through to the end of that particular chapter. Let's read together out loud. Those who believe what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day. About 3,000 in all, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Let's pray together. Wonderful Father in heaven, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. 
It is, for anybody who has studied the Bible much, it is very familiar to us. But there are so many profound things in it, Lord. And we pray that the familiarity that we read would not detract from the amazing story that's revealed here. That instead, we would see things perhaps that we have never seen before. We pray all these things together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. Now, as I mentioned, this is an extraordinarily familiar passage of Scripture to most people. It is a passage of Scripture that gets referred to a lot of times in a lot of different contexts. If you look around in the church world, if you go to something like Google, uh, you just type right in, type in Acts 2 or Acts chapter 2, and then you'll get all kinds of stuff that will come. Very dramatic things happen in Acts chapter 2. Uh, the Holy Spirit falls. The church is invigorated. Peter gets up, and instead of bumbling around and saying something foolish that he has a habit of doing, he preaches a profound and dynamic sermon. And this crowd that's gathered, they, they turn away from their wickedness, and they make a decision to follow Jesus. The Bible tells us 3,000 people were saved on that day. Now, in the modern times, we believe that that location where Peter probably preached that sermon was in the Temple Mount. And the reason we believe that, in addition to the fact that they were there probably for the time of prayer, is it says 3,000 people were believed and baptized. How on earth are you going to baptize 3,000 people? Well, at the foot of the stairs leading up to the temple, there are a number of what they call mikvahs, which are uh, a, a ba uh, small baths where people could get washed, uh, ritually washed before they would go into the temple. And so it seems to be these, these hundreds of small mikvahs would have been the most logical place for all of these people to get baptized, which leads to a kind of an interesting thought in my mind. Just imagine if there were 3,000 people being baptized in, and they had 100 mikvahs. That means that there were going to be 30 people baptized in the same little thing of water. Can you imagine if you were like the 30th one to be baptized and all those other people had been baptized before you? The water would be a little bit dirty by the time you got in there. So hopefully everybody was a little bit generous. But in this passage, we see the church as it first broke forth. And we see patterns for the church that lead us to begin to dream a dream of community. N.T. Wright talks about this in, in this particular passage, and this is what he says. In fact, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 242 is often regarded as laying down the four marks of the church: the apostles' teaching, the common life of those who believed, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. These four things go together. You can't separate them or leave one out without damaging the whole thing. Where no attention is given to teaching and to constant lifelong Christian learning, people quickly revert to the worldview or mindset of the surrounding culture. They end up with their minds shaped by whatever social pressures are most per 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 persuasive. I thought pervasive, and then I read it pro properly. When Jesus sometimes fits in around as a pale influencer memory, where people ignore the common life of the Christian family, and the technical term is fellowship, which is a lot more than friendship, not less than friendship. They become isolated. They find it difficult to sustain a living faith. Where people no longer share regularly in the breaking of bread, the early Christian term for the meal that, that they reminded as they were back in the upper room with Jesus, making that in remembrance. Then they fail to raise the flag, which says Jesus' death and resurrection are the center of everything. And whenever people do these things but neglect prayer, they are simply forgetting that Christians are supposed to be both heaven and earth people. Prayer makes no sense whatever unless heaven and earth are designed to be joined together and we share in that already. You see, this was a community and their community had certain things in common. They had understood that where they were all Jews and had always considered themselves to be God's people, they had become God's new people. They were the ones who were a part of what God was doing, what God was preparing, what God was unfolding that would begin with them and would spread all over the world. Now, when we read about this, we need to keep in mind what kind of models or what kind of things would they have seen in this new community. And it's suggested by Tom Wright that one of the things that would have been common to them was the very nature of the way that businesses and trades and skills were operated in those days. So a man, for instance, let's take 
uh, let's take the skill of uh, a working copper, a coppersmith. And a man would learn from his father how to be a coppersmith. And he would not only learn from his father, but he would work in his father's coppersmith area together. And probably not just him, but probably one or two other workers would be working there as well. And it wouldn't be some factory out at the end of nowhere, but it was probably centered around their home. This was the natural business nature that took place in almost all of those communities around the Mediterranean world. And it wasn't just the son and this other son, but it was also the cousin and the nephew and probably one or two slaves. And all of these people living together, living in the same place together, they became a community. They became an, an, what's called an oikos. They became a group of people together centered around a common trade, a common ability, a common purpose in life. To work with copper, to work with wood, to, to take care of animals, whatever it might have been, it was all what they were doing together. And they would have seen that in many ways as the foundation of their new faith. They were no longer people separated by all of these different things, but in Christ they had all come together. It's just like being in a family. When you're in a family, you, you don't look at the things in your home, you don't go into the home and you say, uh, this is my house, that's my chair, that's my brother's chair, that's my sister's chair, that's my dad's chair. Well, when it comes to dad's chairs, sometimes that's a little sensitive. Sometimes dad picks one chair and nobody else is supposed to sit in it. But, but you know what I'm talking about. You know, you don't say, oh yeah, this is the kitchen, that pot belongs to my mom and nobody's allowed to touch it and you know, all those different kinds of things. Everything in the home, everything in the, that, that is there, it belongs to all of them. It comes from different places. Different people provide different things, but it comes from, it belongs to all of them. There's a famous story about the roadies. Let me tell you a story about Pastor Mike. He's not here, so I'll tell this story and then you guys can just, you'll know it. And when you see him, you can snicker when he walks by. In fact, you can throw it out. But Pastor Mike's dad, Marvin, had this habit. Whenever somebody would get a treat and they would have something special, like some leftover cake or you know something like that that they wanted, and they would put it in the refrigerator, Marvin would raid it. He'd get into the refrigerator, he'd eat it, he'd finish it off, their sandwich, whatever it was. And then when they'd say, hey, what happened to the rest of my sandwich? Marvin would say, well, it didn't have your name on it. And that meant if your name wasn't on it, it was fair game. Round about the time when Pastor Mike was about 10 years old one day at the dinner table, Marvin said, hey, I brought the rest of something home and I put it in the fridge. I wanted to have it for dessert. Where is it? Who ate it? And Mike said, well, it didn't have your name on it and there was nothing that he could say. So next time when Pastor Mike goes walking by, you can just snicker, doesn't have your name on it and he'll know exactly what it's about. But see, that's the point. Other than for courtesy, the food in the fridge is for every member of the family. The chairs in the house are for every member of the family. They come and, and, and they're procured at different times, less so in the modern world, but certainly in the ancient world. These things all belong to everybody. And that's what they were. They were God's new people. They were God's new community. They, the hallmark of their community was four things. Learning. Learning from the apostles. Now, you and I today, we, we, we've got to find a different way of learning from the apostles. We, we, we can't invite Peter to come over and share with us what it felt like to betray Christ and why did he weep bitterly. But we can look into the word of God and as we read the, we read the gospels and we read the letters, we are learning the apostles' teaching. That's why we say God's word changes lives. Ultimately, it is the teaching that they were devoted for that we're also devoted for. It was also that they were devoted to community. Now, community in a church is often can become very superficial. And let's face it, for us in a, in a larger church, it's a very difficult thing. It's really hard in many ways for you to find a relationship with the people who are eight rows over on the right and eight rows over on the left or in front of you or behind you. In fact, folks, it's, it's almost impossible. But there are still ways in which the hallmark of the family of God and the community of God that God wants us to have are the fact that we, we have a relationship with each other. Now, how does it work? Um, it works something like this. I don't know all of you 
But between me and you 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 and you, we know everybody. And so I relate to you and you relate to the others. And in all of this, we develop and create a community where we have real relationship with each other. Now, the drawback of it is some, sometimes it fails. But understand this, folks. If somebody comes to IES and they don't get to know anybody, they never, they never join a small group, they never attend a class, they never join a, 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 a Bible study, they never go to the ladies' life group, or they never go to the IES men, and, and they don't go to a soap group, that's their choice. And we can't make them do it. But if they choose not to, they're left out of the community. We can't dictate community, but we offer community. It's our dream for the future to continue to offer community. It says that they worship. They met in homes for a worship meal. Again, it's complicated for us, but they really believed when they sat down and ate a meal together, that was actually worshiping God and sharing that meal. And part of that worship was to take a piece of bread and remember that we are the body of Christ. And part of that was to take a cup and say, this cup represents the blood of Jesus, which is given to us. It was poured out for our salvation. They met for prayer. It says they met in the same place every day. And we understand that to mean they went to the temple together. Now, certainly they went to the temple in prayer times. And that's where they were when it was time for everybody to go to the temple in Jerusalem in the morning and the afternoon for the different uh, sacrifices of atonement and other events. They fully participated. They gathered together at certain times and their times together were a time of prayer. And they also prayed in homes. This is the way they lived their lives and the result of the way that they lived their lives was that the good news was spread. This tremendous result of being people being saved daily was based on how they lived their lives together in a community. So what is the dream of community for you and I? What is the dream of community that we have for IES? I think it's reflected in what they did, and we'll see the same four things. First of all, it was expressed, the idea of communities was expressed in how they saw each other how they saw each other. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, it says, Never speak harshly to an older man, but appeal to him respectfully as you would your own father. And the older I get, the more I like this verse. Talk to younger men as you would to your own brothers. Treat older women as you would to your mother. Treat younger women with all purity as you would your own sisters. Take care of any widow who has no one else to care for you. They saw each other as family, and they cared for each other in the same way. They saw each other as family, and they cared for each other in the same way. We need to see each other as family. One of the really baffling things about the scripture is, is that you read through the New Testament, you find all these relationships that are reformed, and one of the most amazing things is the relationship with siblings. Now, in the world that we live in today, there's often problems between siblings, and the same thing happened 2,000 years ago. Remember one time Jesus was asked to help divide up an inheritance, obviously because siblings were fighting over it. And it's yet it's interesting that no matter how much we pursue this whole issue of siblings, the New Testament has almost nothing to say about it. And this is why. Because in the body of Christ, in the community of the church, we are all brothers and sisters. It doesn't mean that you care less about your siblings it's that you care more about each other. Expressed in how they saw each other. Secondly, it was expressed in how they saw the world around them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 20, it says, So we've stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, and now we know him so differently. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. And all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us a task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. God. You and I need to learn 
that we need to express that the people around us in this world are not our enemies. It's so easy for us in the church as we talk about our own community to withdraw from the world. This is something the church has gone back and forth on for many, many, many years with monastic orders and escaping away and staying away. And the idea is we need to separate ourselves and keep us as far away as possible. But the Bible makes it really clear that the position of the follower of Jesus Christ and the position of the community of Jesus Christ is that we see the people around us not as enemies, but as people that we need to bring them into the same place that we are. We are ambassadors for Christ. One of the phrases that we use to describe IES is the phrase harvest church. Now, why do we use the idea of harvest church? Well, it's really simple. When you're a farmer and harvest time comes, you don't plan for how much you're going to put in your, in your barns. And then when you get to a certain point, you say, okay, that's enough. We're not going to harvest anymore. You don't see a harvest by what you've already gathered. You see a harvest about what's still out there that needs to be gathered. And our perspective on the world must always be, must always be, not who's here in IES, but who's not here. Who's out there that still needs to be brought in. It ex it's expressed in how they saw the future. Our perspective, like their perspective, must be that we have put away all of these different things and we live for the future reflecting what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. In my Father's house there are many rooms. We don't live for today. We don't live for this world. We live for a future that is coming. And that shift in perspective changes the way that we appeal to the world around us and changes the decisions that we make as we go through this life. As we live for the future, we think differently than the people around us. And finally, it's expressed in how they saw possessions. In Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45, it's kind of controversial to some people. It says, and all the believers met together in one place, that would be the temple, and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. Now, some people uh, would, would mistakenly say, oh, that means when it says they sold everything they had, they really sold everything. No, that's not what's expressed here, because what they're talking about is those people all had homes. They met in homes. So it's not that they uh, uh, got rid of all their assets, but what it's simply saying is those who had were generous to help those people who hadn't. They gathered together in homes. They gathered together in places. They gathered together in the temple. It's like the illustration that I talked about earlier the family of, of a family business. The community shares in the assets of the family. The community of the family, everything belongs not just to one person, and everything contributes for the need of the whole community. You and I no longer meet in homes for our gatherings. The primary way the community of IES gathers is in this place. And soon it will be in another place. And the building that we, ha that we live in, that we occupy together, that's our home. And when we're in our home, we understand that it will belong to each and every one of us, because we participated together in acquiring it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 12 through 15, Paul says this to the Corinthians. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. And give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Of course, I, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean there should be some equality. Right now you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later they will have plenty and they can share with you when you need it. In this way things will be equal, as the scriptures say. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over. And those who gathered only a little had enough. Let's remember the dream of IES. The way we express ourselves to each other is an expression to the world of who we are. The way that we see the people in the world around us, not with hostility for people who don't share our faith and anger towards them, but instead understanding that by the grace of God, if we had not had an opportunity to know Jesus, we would feel the same way. It's expressed in how we see the future. 
that we're not interested in building up earthly kingdoms at all because we're waiting for a kingdom that is an eternal kingdom. And it's expressed on how we see our possessions. As we gather together to acquire our home, all of us participate and it belongs to each and every one of us because of our participation.